The Committee on Workforce Development will now come to order. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Chairman Henderson. Here. Vice Chairman Gregory. Representatives Bangert. Here. Brown. Here. Haley. Here. Hurlbert. Present. Lewis. Person. Railsback. Here. Sharp. Thompson. Here. Washmore. Young. The Committee on Workforce Development, um, having seven present, we've established a quorum. We're going to go into executive session. We had two bills we were going to exec out today. Representative Francis asks us to hold his bill. We'll probably have a committee sub next week with one little caveat in there. We talked about last week with some of the parents, and if we couldn't get them in, so he thinks he has a fix for that. He's been working on with a couple of the departments, and we will come back to it next week. So we will now move on to House Bill 2202, sponsored by... Representative Travis Fitzwater, I have uh, moved that be voted due pass. Any discussion? Seeing none. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Chairman Henderson. Aye. Vice Chairman uh, Gregory. Representatives Bangert. Aye. Brown. Aye. Haley. Aye. Hurlbert. Aye. Lewis. Person. Rails back. Sharp. Sharp. Thompson. Aye. Walshmore. Aye. Young. Aye. Gregory. Aye. Yeah, these are the ones we're not exactly uh, we're hearing this one. <laughs> it's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was workforce development and computer science. So. House Bill twenty two o two. That concludes our executive session. Oh. We will now hold a hearing on House Bill 1740 related to the earnings tax sponsored by Representative Ben Dogan. Uh -uh. Uh, I am the you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Representative Shemed Dogan representing the 98th District, St. Louis County. Um, 1740 is a simple bill. Um, it is not an earnings tax elimination bill. Um, let me get that out of the way first and foremost. Um, we are not touching on the issue of whether or not St. Louis City or Kansas City, the only two entities that have an earnings tax, should or can have an earnings tax. They are completely allowed to have an earnings tax under this bill. The only thing it addresses is the issue that's arisen since the pandemic, um, where we've had lots of people working remotely. And in the past, both St. Louis and Kansas City have allowed people to have um, kind of offsets for their earnings tax for time that they spent where they were not actually working in the city. And unfortunately, um, while Kansas City has done, in my opinion, the right thing and given people prorated earnings taxes based on the number of days that they were not working in Kansas City, that they were working from home if they were not residents, um, and again, this only applies to non-residents because people who are residents of St. Louis and Kansas City still do have to pay the earnings tax, even under this bill, um, because they are residents of those cities. This has to do with non-residents, like people who live in St. Louis County in my district, um, people who live in Jefferson County, any of the surrounding counties um, of St. Louis City who pay the earnings tax but are not working in St. Louis City and have not been working in many cases for almost two years in St. Louis City. And that's an issue of fairness. Um, those taxpayers in St. Louis City and St. Louis City alone have been still forced to pay the earnings taxes. Kansas City's done the right thing and given those people refunds. St. Louis City is refusing to do so. There's some lawsuits uh, that are involved in that as well. Um, but my bill simply says that for the purposes of uh, tax returns filed, and there's kind of an error in the bill. Um, I want to point that out. It says filed on or after January 24. January 1st, 2022. Um, that was kind of a mistake that should be for 2021, going back to last year, um, that work done or services performed or rendered in the city should not include work performed through telecommuting or otherwise. Um, so just making clear that people who are not actually working in the city who aren't using those city services should not have to pay the earnings tax. Um, I think that's a matter of fairness. I think that's something that is good for um, the taxpayers, um, 
who are paying the earnings tax and something that at the end of the day is good for the entire state. So happy to take your questions. Any discussion? Representative um, Banger, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, to inquire. Proceed. Thank you. How much, um, good, good afternoon, by the way. Good afternoon. How much money um, is the city of St. Louis going to lose um, if this is enacted? There's a, there's a fiscal note that talks a little bit about some of those guesstimates. Um, and it's saying that it's $20 million or unknown for 2024. 2023, it's $87 million potentially. Um, so it's a good chunk of change. And um, I, those are just guesstimates. Um, so we don't know entirely how much uh, because those taxpayers would uh, be eligible to get that refund. But it just depends on how much of it. You know, we'd have to calculate how many days they were actually working outside of the city and that kind of thing. And I don't know if anybody has those exact numbers. That, that seems like a, a lot of money to me. Um, to did people come to you saying that they were unhappy paying the the earnings tax? I mean, how did, how did you come up with this bill? I've I've read a lot of uh, accounts about that lawsuit in the newspapers, and I've also heard from people throughout the St. Louis region, not just my constituents, but people who live all over the place. You know, people who live in St. Louis County, people who live in Franklin County, Jefferson County. Um, and one of the interesting things to me about the St. Louis city earnings tax is that I think – um, close to a majority, if not an actual majority, of the people who pay the earnings tax in St. Louis City don't reside in the city. Um, and so I understand it's something that's going to be a hit for them. But again, if the justification for an earnings tax is that people are consuming city services and those people are working from home, they're working in Franklin County, they're working in a lot of cases, they're not setting foot in the St. Louis City at all for them to have to pay a tax to a jurisdiction where they're not living and they're not even working doesn't make sense at all. My son actually lives in West County, and he works for Anheuser-Busch, so he pays the earnings tax. He feels that it's a contribution towards our city and our whole community, so he has no problem paying that tax. And sometimes he'll work three or four days at his home and then maybe go in one day to the you know, actual location. Sometimes he'll work two or three days at the actual location and then be at home, just depending upon his schedule. So who is keeping track of when people are working in the city and when they're not working in the city? I think, I the, mean, employers, gonna, I think the employers already do that. Um, because like I said, they're doing, they're doing those refunds in Kansas City because they've always had that kind of policy in place. Um, it's just that with the pandemic, I think St. Louis City honestly was just probably hard up for money. Um, and with the situation that St. Louis City is in right now where they're getting all this money, $500 million or something from the RAM settlement, um, where they're getting all kinds of money from the feds, I think they're in a better situation than they would be in normal years to be able to handle the offset from losing this revenue. So this is only going to take place then for a couple of years and then we'll go back to everyone having to pay it? Yeah, as is long as bill... people are going back to working in the offices, they, they're they going to pay the earnings taxes. And for the day, for, for people like your son, if he's working at Anheuser-Busch in the city, you know, however many days a week, you know, if he's working one day a week, he should have to pay the earnings tax for that one-fifth of the time that he's uh, working in the city. That's... It just seems to me that it's going to take a lot of effort from these employers and just the employees keeping track of who's working where and coming up with um, the figures for that. And you did mention you didn't know how many people that lived and worked in the city, and I did look that up. There's 60 percent uh, of people live and work in the city. So, so it's 40 percent. Sorry, not, not half, but that's yeah. still a pretty good chunk. Okay. Thank you. Representative Haley. She kept, Okay. Representative Holbert, proceed. Thank you to inquire. So, Representative Dogan, I I live in the greatest city of Smithville here in the state of Missouri. But in 2020, I worked in uh, the city limits of Kansas City. So, uh, as w many of us, we had you know the same issue over in Kansas City. But uh, what I was able to do was I was able to uh, just file a simple form, to send it to the city of KCMO. Uh, revenue department and have them uh, and they 
just accepted it as face value. It was not hard for me to file. It wasn't hard for me to get uh, make sure that you know the earnings taxes that uh, I didn't actually work in the city limits of Kansas City. I didn't have to pay. Um, so I appreciate this bill. I appreciate you bringing uh, some you know consistency across the state with this bill, and look forward to supporting it. Thank you, Representative Young. Proceed to inquire. Afternoon, Representative. Good afternoon. Uh, I just really have one question, um, and maybe I'll preface it with a comment. So the non-residents that you're referring to are connected or potentially affected by this bill because they work for a company or a business that's in the city or the state? That's correct. So don't those businesses also uh, provide those employees um, because they are a business in the state of Missouri or in these cities that we're referring to today, Kansas City and St. Louis, they um, have access to some of those same services, right? Even if it's internet service, uh, their employee is using internet, um, say, for instance, in Smithville, but they're not in the office. But if they're physically not there, you know, what, whatever percentage of their workforce is working from home, that that's a decrease in the amount of infrastructure that that, that company is using, right? They're using less electricity. They're having pe fewer people drive on the roads. They're having fewer people do all the things that they would normally do when they're commuting in. But they are employing those employees wherever they are, and it's still, right, it's still uh, resources that are being used, whether it's one or two, three or four. Well, so the earnings tax is a tax on those individuals, though. It's not on the corporation itself. Um, so, uh, again, I think But those, those individuals are, are benefiting from the services that the companies and businesses also use. I mean, you know, if it's the businesses are located probably on a street, um, the businesses may even have to call in law enforcement for some issue. Um, and we can go down the line, but they are benefiting from what the company is providing them, even if it's Internet service. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, I think, again, the fact that Kansas City is giving this refund to its taxpayers because they acknowledge that, you know, in the era of COVID where people are working from home and they're not using all those services physically, um, it's just the right thing to do to give those taxpayers that money back. Uh, because these are working folks, right? These aren't just rich people we're talking about. These are people doing day-to-day -day work at whatever companies that they're working in. And, you know, every little pinch from their pocketbook that any government is taking out of their pocketbook hurts them, you know? So I, I think we ought to just try and get our cities to do the right thing and tax them where they are actually using those services. I said one, but... Um, wh where will, how will we make up that lost revenue? Do you have any idea how the lost revenue will be made up, though? I, that's not my job, right? I mean, I don't know how Kansas but, City made theirs up. Right, you but know, I know the so. bill, typically, um, I, I would assume we look at bills and we think about how it might impact um, our revenues, the people, our constituents. Sure. And so I was just curious if you thought about it when you were coming up with this bill. Yeah, no, I, I don't have impact. any recommendations, but I would tell the city of St. Louis to look at what the city of Kansas City did to make up for that revenue um, because I think, it, I think it ends up being a wash because they're getting fewer services used um, and then they would get fewer taxes coming in, but I, I think at the end of the day it doesn't really hurt them on net. Okay, thank you. Representative Washmore, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry. <laughs> I, it's it's first of meeting of the day, so it's still morning. It's been a while since we all seen each other. It's, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, um, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, as someone who has worked in St. Louis City and lived in St. Louis City, worked in St. Louis City, worked in the county, been back and forth several times, um, I, I understand what you're trying to do. But by, I think by comparison – Comparing St. Louis to Kansas City, I mean, that's really, that's not exactly comparing apples to oranges. And you and I both know that. I mean, the city limits of Kansas City 
are not the same as the city limits of St. Louis. So when we're talking about adding in, you know, oh, well, folks in the county, I mean, that's the majority of the population of St. Louis. I mean, if we look at it, I mean, this is another tragedy of the city county divorce. Yeah. Well, uh, and those and are your constituents and mine, though. They and are. I, I, stra- <laughs> as I represent people in the city and the county. And uh, this is so to compare, you know, well, they don't live in the city. I would wager that a lot of people who would benefit from this, who maybe work in the city but don't live outside the limits, live much closer to the city center than anyone who is outside Kansas City. And so if we're talking proximity, I mean, we're still talking about massive highway infrastructures. I mean, you enjoy going to the zoo. I know you have kids and we have the zoo. We have a lot of Pay great taxes for that. infrastructures. <laughs> And we have a lot of infrastructures that go on in the city. And pay taxes for can, that too, but I don't pay the earnings tax because I don't work in the city. So people who aren't working in the city shouldn't be paying the earnings tax for the city. But again, there's the population of the city is so small because of the way we that the city of St. Louis has chosen to divide itself from the county. And that's that's the ongoing issue is the population of the city of St. Louis is, and that that's a self-created problem admitted. But if we're going to compare and say, well, Kansas city did it. I mean, the people who live outside the Kansas city limits of what this earnings tax is truly live a goodly distance away from their company. Whereas if we're looking at St. Louis, I mean, the city county divide, it's not it's not the same. It's not apples and or it's not. Apples that's, the, apples. that's the only comparison point we have, though, because those are the only two cities that have an earnings tax in the state. So. Who else would I compare I guess, it to? Right. I, well, <laughs> I mean, I guess I, I see what you're saying, but it's 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 not the same. And it's if we're going to compare this and look at this, it is another problem of the city county divide, not so much it's not the same basically is what i'm saying and it's not going to benefit i don't i don't see how it's going to benefit anyone any of these employees in the long run yeah it might be an immediate the employees thing. want to pay taxes when they don't when the they look at the other side of the state and people aren't paying the tax or they look at st louis county like if a St. Louis City resident works in St. Louis County, they don't pay an earnings tax. If a St. Louis City resident works in Jefferson County, they don't pay an earnings tax to those counties. Nobody else in the state charges an earnings tax for people who live outside that jurisdiction to work there. So I, I think we're already in a unique place, St. Louis and Kansas City are, where they charge this extra tax on top of the other taxes that they already collect. And again, I'm not going after their ability to to charge an earnings tax as much as I might not like the idea necessarily, but fair is fair. If you're going to charge an earnings tax, it should be about charging people for the infrastructure that they're using while they are at work. And if they are working from home, they are not using that infrastructure. So, you know, prorate what, what you uh, charge in taxes to what services people are using. But this bill goes on indefinitely, correct? Yeah, because that's that was actually the practice of St. Louis City before the pandemic, that they would give people refunds no problem because they kind of acknowledge that principle that if you're not working in the city, you know, a third of the year, or half of the year or something, we won't charge you the earnings tax. So it's, if I, I, I'm terribly sorry. Um, assuming that, um, I mean, like, let's talk about Anheuser Busch. I mean, do you think that they'll stay in St. Louis and still offer these jobs? to the employees if they they can do this remotely anywhere? Well, I think that's one of the reasons that the earnings tax has been harmful to those cities is because it's an extra tax that nobody else is charging. I, I think from a policy standpoint, we ought to look at whether or not those earnings taxes are helpful. But if, if companies are going to, you know, I, I think that's something companies would consider as they bring their workforces back in person, right? <clears throat> I think... I think that's something any company would have to consider is what kinds of taxes their employees are going to be paying. I hope they do bring their people back in person as much as possible. If they do bring their people back in person, then the cities get more earnings tax, right? So win-win. All right. That, that's all. Thank you. Representative, I have a, I have a couple questions. So my daughter, you, I'm kind of familiar with this. My daughter used to work in the Cortex District. 
part of that downtown. So they paid the earnings tax, and she no longer works there, but I remember the earnings tax on it. So this is on services. Is that correct? That's why we have that earnings tax in theory is to pay for the services that they're using. Is that correct? That's right. And what is it? Is it 1.5%? Um, I am embarrassed that I don't know. I think it's 1%. But one percent. Okay, so it's one percent. I think they're saying I think it's a flat up here. 1%. And um, I guess my thought on it is, if people aren't really using it, it was set up. I think it was just passed recently again, wasn't it? Wasn't it passed by the people in St. Louis recently again? Yeah. Which is which is fine. They have every right to decide if they want to tax themselves more. I believe in that in that theory. That's a that's a choice they can make. But if these people aren't working up there and using those services, if that's really what it's for. And it was, I think it was passed as it was for the services that they're using of the city. I, I would say that I agree with you. If they're not using those services, they shouldn't have to pay that that tax any longer when they're not working remotely. And it was brought up about some companies may decide not to keep people working remotely. I think that's the new world we're going to live in that everybody's going to have to adjust to a little bit. I think they're going to see more and more of that. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. And I think I mean, there's some opportunities, too, for us to get people who are working <clears throat> at other places. People who are working on the East Coast or the West Coast can telecommute and earn West Coast wages and stay in, you know, Missouri. Um, I think there's opportunities for us to be getting virtual workers. So we ought to be looking at ways to do that, for sure. You know, and, and I think when they when they vote this in, they the only people who vote on it are the people who live in St. Louis. Is that correct? That's right. So... That's fine. They should get to vote on it. But a lot of these people, this 40% that don't work in there, really never got to, to vote on that, did they? No, we don't. Or they and, don't. And, so, and, and I think if they choose to go work in St. Louis, they should have to pay it. But if they're not working there, I, I would say that I agree with you that they shouldn't have to pay it if they're, not, if they're actually not working there. I think there's a little bit of a fairness issue in my opinion. Would you agree with that? There is. And it's and it's not saying you don't have to pay any taxes if you're working from home. It's just whatever percentage of the time you're working from home. So. The, the the extra tax for the time you're not, you would have to pay the extra tax for the time you're not working there. That's right. And those companies, I don't know what all software they use and how they calculate it, but I think that's something that's fairly easy for them to calculate what percentage of time you were in the office and what percentage of time you were out. Okay. Any other questions for Representative Dogan? Seeing none. Thank you very much. Um, witnesses, I'd ask you before we call them up there, please make sure you filled out a form or you uh, you leave one at the desk or if you filled it out online and we have anybody to testify and support. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Chuck Pierce, and I'm here today representing Associated Industries of Missouri. There's been a lot of discussion about the earnings tax, but really from our perspective, what I want to talk about is the issue of consistency. So um, the sponsor already explained we have exactly the same law that authorizes an earnings tax in Kansas City and St. Louis. Um, and there's been different interpretation of what the technical term for this is, is called payroll nexus. It's where you tax this, the, the work that's performed. So there's two different definitions of that. So now, from a consistency standpoint, think about that. Kansas City did not change theirs. This is the way they've, they've done it forever. Uh, there's a form that you have to fill out. You go to your employer. Your employer attests that you really weren't working in the office on those days, and you would get a refund. They kept that policy. Uh, the city of St. Louis redefined the definition of nexus to specifically exclude telecommuting. Okay, so now we have an inconsistent definition of the same statute. Now, think about that. If you have a company that has an office in St. Louis downtown, and an office in Kansas City downtown. You're, and because of COVID, you sent a lot of people home. It happened all over the state. Your employees in Kansas City are going to get a refund for the time that they stayed there. Your employees in St. Louis are not. And it's the exact same law that's in, that's in place. As an employer, that's a pretty difficult thing to, to explain uh, back and forth. The other thing is consistency overall with what constitutes what we call payroll nexus. Nexus is about a jurisdiction's ability to tax you. 
And so payroll nexus has always been about where the work is actually performed. So if you live in Oklahoma and work at an office in Joplin and you come into Joplin, your employer has to take out Missouri withholding for you. Now you file a return in both states and you equalize that. If you live in Joplin and you work in Oklahoma and you drive over there every day, then they take Oklahoma withholdings out of your tax. That's the way it's always been. That's the way it is in all jurisdictions. We think um, this legislation really undoes the definition that St. Louis adopted, which in our opinion is not consistent with a, a, a normal definition of a payroll nexus. The other thing I would point out, it sets up a different cause of action. So the existing uh, rules allow for refunds, but remember this is 1% of, of your pay only for the portion that you're not working. So if the city decides to deny the refunds, then your only choice is to hire an attorney and go to court. Well, you know, even if you're making $100,000 and spend half your time outside the, the city, uh, you, you really can't afford to hire an attorney and go to court to, to get that money back. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for this witness? Proceed. I'm sorry. I'm just a little confused. Um, so this nexus, that's how everyone's paid in the whole country? or No, that's how. So nexus is about, I'm sorry, that's, that I, I shouldn't have gone down that rabbit hole. But that, that is how a state decides whether your employer has to take out payroll taxes or whether they can, uh, they can tax it. Uh, nexus is... If you remember Wayfair, when we passed that legislation mm -hmm. last year, that set up the definition of nexus for remote selling. As it relates, to, and this is an issue that states particularly are, have struggled with a lot. I mean, there are a lot of people who ended up with Illinois withholding uh, because they'd been working in St. Louis or St. Louis County. They lived in Illinois. They had previously had withholding in Missouri, but they spent six months working from their home. So their employer had to withhold Illinois taxes, send that to the state of Illinois, so Illinois would be sure they filed an Illinois return and, and asked for that refund back. So then how does an individual get their money back if they're not going to pay the, the taxes? It's a one-page form? Is that what you said? One of the representatives said there was a right. one-page form right. in Kansas so, City? So the, the, the technical part of the process is there's a, there is a refund form. So you would fill that out. You would calculate the number of days that you did not perform work inside the city. Your employer would verify that for you, and uh, then you would get a refund. So to your point, if the, employer do, if the employer doesn't want to keep records or wants to dispute the employee's records, there's no, there's no path forward. Somebody has to want to do this and keep the records that show where they are working. So that's going to take time on the employee's behalf to fill out the form as well as the employer because the employer is going to have to sign off on it. Well, <clears throat> not, and that's where the concept of nexus comes in. Employee, employers already track where you do the work because they, they have to do that for, for payroll withholding. Now, if it was a, in the county or work from home situation, if they didn't have a record of that or didn't want to keep a record of that, then that's going to be between the employer and the employee. There's nothing in this bill that requires an employer to keep to track where their employees work. Well, well, I mean, they have to sign off on the form. I'm just talking about the form. If I'm an employee, I have to spend some time filling out this form, and then my employer has to spend time signing off on the form. I'm just saying it's just going to take extra time where they could be actually doing their job. So yeah, thank you. What, the form's not required. I mean, if, if you want the refund, you have, to, you have to provide some kind of documentation to get a refund back. Any other questions for this witness? Seeing none, thank you very much. Anybody else to testify in support? Okay, anybody to testify in opposition? Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Tom Vollmer. I'm the Deputy Collector of Revenue for the City of St. Louis. I collect this earnings tax, so I'm up here to basically answer your questions or anything that might have of concern of yours. Um, the earnings tax was generated 60 years ago, and pretty much the earnings tax came into play because of the basically urban sprawl 
we're one of 39 cities that has an earnings tax. We copied this tax from the state of Phil from Philadelphia. They were the very first ones, and they charge 4%. We only charge 1%. New York has it. They charge 5%. It's a, and basically it's an earnings tax. It's with all the employees check. These people that are, work remotely and everything like we alluded to, this case is in court right now and it is being done through the justice system. Let them handle it and whatever the judges rule, we will abide by. But they're earning money for a city-based business. They're still performing their same jobs. They're just doing it remotely. Questions for this witness? Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How, are you aware of any other cities that have changed their earning tax structure because of COVID? I know Kansas City has, but are any other of these cities that you're talking about, these 39? Uh, the, 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 we pretty much have all met, and we have a, um, an annual conference, and everybody's on the same page as the city of St. Louis. They're still taxing. Nobody has changed the rules. They're all still charging. We still allow for a refund for people that work their actual job and travel. Like if you're based in St. Louis City and you go to Kansas City or go to um, uh, Springfield to do your job, we allow for those days. We just don't allow for remote working because you're still performing that job for a city-based company. You're, you're benefiting that, that business in the city of St. Louis. So like your son that works in Anheuser-Busch, he's doing his job, he's just not sitting physically in that building, but he's still doing the same job from home. Okay, one other question. I know that it goes to a vote of the people in the city of St. Louis. How often does that vote take place? Every five years. Every five years. Thank you. I, I've got a, a, a question. I think we've had an answer, but I kind of want to get your interpretation. So what is the earnings tax at its base? What's it for? It's a. It basically goes to the general fund. It, it pretty much um, streets police, fire, it's basically your public services, anything the general fund, it, it generates one-third of the city budget. Okay, so it's for the city services. Is yes. Correct. Okay, yes. so we'd had that conversation earlier. Do you believe that with all of those people working remotely, there's as much put on the city services? Well, it doesn't matter. You still have to provide your streets. That, that business still exists. The police, the fire, the, the, you know, you can't just say, okay, today the people aren't coming to work, so we don't have to pave the streets. I mean, it's, 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 it's an ongoing expense. You guys know that. Any other questions for the witness? Yes, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So to clarify here, St. Louis, uh, the city of St. Louis, does it also charge an earnings tax to the employer, not just the employee? It's a payroll expense tax. They have a percent, one, one half percent. So regardless of whether that employee is actually telecommuting in, if the employer is within city limits, you are still collecting a tax if on that employee? Only, well, if, like if they traveled outside the city and the wages were benefiting them from a remote location, that payroll tax is in charge. Under the uh, representative's bill, we wouldn't we wouldn't charge the half percent on non wages that were earned. It's basically it's a half percent of the one percent. So we wouldn't charge that half a percent payroll tax for work not performed in the city. But what I'm saying is that these companies are pro still paying into St. Louis City's coffers in order to provide, you know, those services to the business. But well, while the employees not actually, they are not actually using any of these services, then your your argument is that they should still be paying into the system even if they aren't using the services. Well, let's see. It's basically like it's having the court system right now. It's being heard, and for the next couple of weeks, we should get a decision from the courts on, on, on their position on us, on us taxing telework. The payroll tax came about in 1988, we used to charge five dollars a person, and they ruled, the courts ruled that that was illegal. So they did away with the five dollar head tax, and then we turned around and instituted the payroll expense tax. Well, thank you. Yeah, I've got one question because I'm uh, maybe I'm the only one a little bit confused there. But so it's one percent on the earnings tax, but is there a half a percent on top of that? That's paid by the employer. The one percent comes out of the employee's check. The the one percent earnings is paid by the employee. The company pays a half percent payroll tax for for wages earned in the city. Okay, so in other words, it's one and a half percent, one for the employee, a half percent for the business. So it's one and a half. So I knew I'd heard that number one time of one and a half percent. And you're saying you don't collect the half a percent 
if the employee if is, the wages aren't earned within the city of St. Louis, if the if the wages if they sent the employee to travel for his job, those wages are not charged. That that's the simplest way I can put it. Okay, that helps me. Thank you. Thank you. I had one other question. I'm sorry. You had mentioned something about a lawsuit. Can you explain to me what that lawsuit's oh, about? Several individuals that live in outside the city of St. Louis filed a suit because we denied their refund for days worth telecommunication. So basically right now the court's deciding whether or not the city of St. Louis can tax telework. That's pretty much what the, that's the simplest the, 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 the case involves. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none. Thank you, sir. Okay. Anybody else to testify in opposition? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Demetrius Alfred. I'm the president of Missouri State Council of Firefighters and the president of Local 73 IFF uh, Firefighters in St. Louis City. I represent the firefighters, dispatchers, EMTs, and paramedic. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, and we would like to speak in opposition of this bill. Uh, as the deputy uh, collector just said, this is one-third of the revenue of our uh, budget, St. Louis City, and if we bother that or eliminate that, cut it in half, it could be catastrophic for public safety services, uh, and definitely the fire department. So I appreciate that, uh, the opportunity to speak, and we are in opposition of it. Any questions for this witness? Seeing none, sir, thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else to speak in opposition? Seeing none, anybody for informational purposes only? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Representative Dogan, you have anything in conclusion? That will conclude the hearing on House Bill 1740. And at this time, we will have, we're holding a hearing on House Bill 2493 relating to teacher career plans sponsored by Representative Black. Representative, proceed when you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee for hearing House Bill 2493 dealing with uh, teacher career plan. I'm Representative Rusty Black, representing the 7th District of the state of Missouri in north central Missouri. This bill is similar, well, it's the same as a bill that I filed last year, and uh, it made it through part way through the process, but not to conclusion, obviously, as many things did. Uh, last year, hopefully not this year, but we'll see. This uh, bill, the, the focus on this bill and why did I look at uh, changes on it, and uh, it was something I worked with the Speaker's office on as well, was again looking at teacher pay in our state, and this was a way, a merit system, uh, to reward teachers for extra work in uh, three basic areas. Student, helping with st students, increasing opportunity for students, professional development, uh, that instructor doing things to uh, improve their skills in the classroom. And the final thing, there is a little bit of room in there for community engagement as well, is one of the three components. Is this something new? No. For those of you that have been around education, you know, teacher career plans were something, and I don't, I can't, maybe somebody on the committee can help me, I should have researched this, late 90s, early 2000s is when this was put uh, put forth and started in our state. Um, I think at the same time, it was one of those things to help reward teachers that had been in the profession and give them an opportunity to boost their pay. You are... Uh, being presented today with somebody when career ladder went away, that's what we called it. You know, that was about a $10,000 hit to my family living. And it wasn't like anybody sitting in your shoes a long time ago in budget were trying to be mean to teachers, instructors, school at that point in time. 
but uh, some of us in here are old enough to remember 2008, 2009, and the collapse that we had, and that included uh, the state, I think, making nearly a billion dollar cut to our budget, uh, the state budget, and this was one of those line items that was funded through a separate line, so it was a way to go get, I think at the time it was in the 30 millions, I may be mistaken, may have been low 40, to be able to help fill in the gap other places that need to be done. Fast forward to where we're at now. When to re teacher career plans were started, they were started with the idea that uh, teachers needed to be teaching five years before that began. So if you have it in front of you, I want to walk through some of the changes this bill that is proposed in this bill and then uh, take any questions. I do, uh, there's going to be a question, what do you think about this compared to the governor's recommendation uh, with a minimum of 38000 because this could be competing for the same dollars. I realize that we probably can't do both and we need to support one. Uh, I'm going to say the $38,000 thing is the thing I'm going to support at this point in time, but if it becomes available money this year or next year, then I would like to see these changes put into career ladder and help. So if you can follow along, I'll try not to um, take a lot of your time. I'm on page two. If you uh, want to follow along and see some of the reasoning behind some of the changes that I've made, uh, page two, line 33 teacher externships. What does that mean? That means teachers going into the community and the workforce, summer, weekend, et cetera, normally non-paid positions, and get that experience in those areas. And this would be, they could keep track of those hours in that time. It really wasn't something that was discussed very um, hard. Nobody really had probably thought about when career ladder plans began back in that late 90s, that discussion, uh, early 2000s. Then we jump to line 38. And if you read that uh, line, I'll, I'll try to just paraphrase it. And I've said this before, before Representative Black, Rusty Black, could uh, decide to participate in career ladder back in the time when it started, I had to have finished five years of teaching. At the end of my fifth year, I could fill out this plan and put it in front of a committee at the school. And then if I completed that plan in July, at the end of my sixth year, I would receive that bonus. And that first year for a while was $1,500. I think, considering where we're at and the need to try to hold teachers, uh, my experience and down here, experience counts some days, and it's worthless the next day, right? <laughs> so my experience was if we could get somebody to make it to year five, they might stay in there, start looking at retirement and some of those things. But getting young ag teachers, and I honestly probably have a little bit of uh, blinders on for ag teachers, getting them to make it to year five was darn hard because they could take off and do something else. So I'm saying at the end of year two, they fill out the plan. End of year three, they get that little bonus right before they go on vacation or something in July. I think it would help motivate those people to stay a little longer. And my experience, again, which isn't worth a lot, I'm sure, but my experience is at the end of the third year, teaching the, the heck of teaching becomes reduced. You know, you get comfortable in your job, et cetera. So if we can get them to stay in that time, I think it's benefit. So there's a reason why I did too, and you probably want me to hurry up, right? Line 44, additional responsibilities. I underlined that in my notes. Uh, many of us like to hear, do you do more for more money? You know, the idea of merit pay. And that's what this system was developed around. Put in additional hours and you could get an additional stipend. And of course, some people last year gave me trouble because they knew how lazy I was. They were surprised I got it. Okay, outside of compensated hours, that's down on line 47, outside of compensated hours, and may include but shall not be limited to. So it needs to be out of the regular school day. If I wrote down that I was doing something extra and it started at noon on work day, it didn't count. 
And uh, I know somebody that did that. She wouldn't allow me to count sleeping time at FFA camp. Some of you, two of you in here may know what that means. But I always argued with my wife because she redlined my stuff and I would do it just to make her mad. She was chairman of the committee. But uh, at our local school, whenever there was a fight down there and I had to break up a fight at 2 o'clock in the morning, there was nobody from school driving down there to do it. I'm the one that had to wake up and take care of it. She didn't like that excuse. 49, serving as coach, supervisor, organizer. Yes, some of those are paid, some are non-paid. Okay, so it has to be a non-paid position. Serving as a mentor for students, whether formal or informal capacity, you know, that does happen, and it happens a lot in career ed, and I wish it would happen in other sections as well, and it does, it does, but it happens a lot with career ed teachers. Receiving additional teacher training or certification outside of that offered by the school district, so that's that professional development, and for somebody that survived education for 33 years, some people even thought I did a halfway decent job once in a while. I don't think I ever created anything new in my entire 33 years. I always stole it from somebody else and called it my own. So that was a good part about professional development. You get to learn about those things you can steal. Serving as a tutor, providing additional learning opportunities. Uh, many, many teachers do that especially in the lower grade level, you know, below high school, that gives them an opportunity. They're already doing it, so they can write down those hours, get some benefit, and some people start new programs because of this, so that's good. Assisting students with post-secondary education prep, ACT, SAT, career school admission, financial assistance, so those are examples, but that's not a limited list. If you go down to 83, in case you get hit on that with an email, uh, the speech pathologist a few years ago, they uh, changed their classification within schools. It's not real important for most of you unless you know a speech pathologist. And they, are no, they, no, longer own, uh, they no longer participate in school with a teaching certificate. They have a clinical licensure. Well, when they flipped over to clinical licensure, that took them out of this opportunity. So that's clearly making this a possibility for them. Let's go to page four, another change. Uh, you can see what it was on line 16. And what it was, I'm talking about what percentage of the budget the state took care of in this. Uh, originally 40. I'm switching the state percentage over to 60. Uh, local funding from 60 down to 40. Does anybody need that explained? I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, when you look at fiscal note, uh, I believe this is the same as it was last year. And, of course, you know it is, it is a little bit of wag, I'm sure, because you don't know for sure what schools are going to end up participating in this. But looking at how things ended... The fact that people can't start at the very top of the heap. They can't start getting $5,000 a year. They got to start at the bottom again, $1,500. They were guesstimating $18.7 million to be able to start a little bit better than that. And uh, of course, if you want to, you can read on into some of the other things what uh, Desi believes they'll probably need one FTE to be able to take care of that. And uh, I would without a doubt, believe that that's probably likely to do that. Uh, and if I remember right, that's the only group that um, out that uh, sent any information in about this. So with that, my goal would be to have you uh, completely confused, but just vote yes when this comes up in committee, and I will entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Black. Representative Haley, proceed. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Representative Black, for bringing this forward. Uh, I do remember the old days of career ladder, and uh, it was not a great opportunity for some. Uh, not all school districts could do it. Um, it's hard to, it's hard to um, describe the amount of work that many teachers put in. And, um, you know, it, it's difficult for a teacher that um, works five to six hours after everybody else goes home. And uh, they're sitting there and, and really putting their life into their career. And um, they realize that many of the other staff members get paid the same amount 
and they're gone at three o'clock or three thirty or whenever it is. So it's it is um, important that we bring this forward, and I appreciate that. And also um, having had uh, both a daughter and a daughter-in-law that were in the ag education profession themselves, and actually made it to the, over the five-year mark. Uh, but just couldn't quite keep up with the rigor and the extra 25 to 30 hours a week that it took, uh, both changed occupations uh, out of the classroom. Uh, so um, it's, it's just my comment is that this will go a long way in encouraging young people or in any age person to continue to give it their all and contribute to education what they deserve. Thank you, though. Representative Bangert, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, did this did this come through the education committee last year? Okay, I thought I was familiar with this. Um, do you remember what the vote was out of the committee? No, I think it was, I don't. I think it was pretty you close. Remember? I think it was pretty close to unanimous. Yeah. Um, Representative Hill and I had a long banner back and forth. That, well, that that was pretty pretty common in that yeah. committee. So. Yeah. <laughs> but we had a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And we we certainly do in education. What do we have? About 25 bills tomorrow in education at 8 a.m. So, yeah, it'll be a, a hot spirited one. Um, just a couple of comments. Um, I like it that you support the 38,000 minimum uh, teacher pay that the governor has requested versus this. Although um, my daughter would have loved this program. She started at less than $30,000 a year as a high school math teacher in a rural uh, school district and started a lacrosse program. And the lacrosse program, she started herself, a club program. She did not get paid at all to start that program. Needless to say, I bought some lacrosse nets and some other stuff uh, to donate to that program. And the program was very successful and now is in its sixth year. And um, if she would have had that pay those first couple of years, that would have been great. She worked a job at a grocery store every Sunday in order to um, make extra money that she could have made, you know, if she would have been able to have this career ladder plan. So I think it's great and a great way to definitely support our teachers. And as Representative Haley said, you know, so many folks leave the profession because you can make a lot more money and work a lot less hours and people don't realize how many hours go into being a teacher. So thank you. Uh, Representative Walshmore, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Black, for this. As the daughter of a school teacher uh, for over 20 years, um, I know my mom, We there, the Walsh children made up a lot of the extra time. Uh, we were, after we finished our homework, we had to help mom grade hers. And, uh, you know, our summers were spent going to um, all different educational sites. If you ever come to St. Louis, I am happy to play tour guide because I have been to pretty much any location in the city and county in the greater area making worksheets so mom could take them on her field trips and things like that. So, um, and we certainly could have used the extra money being one of four kids. I know on a school teacher salary was definitely uh, some tough times at home. So uh, I, I love this. I love that you're flip-flopping the, uh, that the majority will be coming from the state. I think a lot of I hope a lot more of the smaller school district, as Rep Haley said, will pick this up as it is less burdensome on the local school districts. I think that's great. And um, I, I hope we can move this forward. So thank you for bringing it. I have just a, a comment or two I'd like to make. I, I was there in 1998 when it started. I was a school administrator at that time. So I think that was the year it started. Um, it's been made... It's worked very well a lot of places. Like in one of yours in line 56, 57, 58, it talks about assisting students on ACT and SAT. We did the ACT at our school. We would have a math, English, and science teacher every weekend for about four weekends in a row. Maybe not the same teacher every weekend. Come in on a Saturday and work with those kids to try to prepare them for the ACT. And how did we compensate them? Career ladder. And how did it work for the kids? Our ACT scores went up for like four or five years in a row. They kept going up in the district because we put the time in to do the do the prep work with them. So I think it does work. I think you're also correct. We lose those teachers in the first five years because the, the pay isn't going to keep them there, and, and they get burnt out sometimes. And this is something to give them a little extra for, for the extra work they do. And a lot of our teachers are doing a lot of this work right now uncompensated, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I think it would be good to try to make sure that we're showing them that we appreciate that extra work they're doing. So I really appreciate you bringing this forward. As far as externships, they're happening in around my area already. A company called U.S. Tool will take these teachers. They currently pay them. But if you had career ladder, they could probably choose to take the pay in the summer or not. They're doing, doing a lot of our 
career and tech people are um, vocational teacher, teachers and bring them in to work in their in their factory in the summer to try to show them what they can do so they can go back and tell their kids the kind of jobs that are there. So I think this all ties in really well with what we're trying to do with career and technical right now, too. Thank you. Any other questions for the witness? Thank you very much. Anybody to, um, to testify, excuse me, any witnesses in support? Any questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you very much. Anybody else to testify in support? Any questions for this witness? Thank you very much. Anybody else testify in support? Any questions? Thank you very much. Anybody else to testify in support? Anybody to testify in opposition? Anybody to testify for informational purposes only? Seeing none, that will conclude our hearing on, this concludes the hearing on workforce development.